Okay, good afternoon, uh, folks. Uh, welcome to another uh, edition of uh, Encore Learning Presents. And I am David Tate. I'm a member of the Encore Learning Special Events Committee, uh, which works hard to bring you these events. And if you're interested in uh, also helping out, um, volunteering, we'd love to have you join us on the committee. If you uh, you can just express your interest by sending an, e sending an email to info at EncoreLearning dot net. Uh, with that, um, uh, I think today we have a very interesting presentation. I mean, it should come as no surprise that women have made significant contributions in the field of architecture. And for those who are surprised by that, you've come to the right place. Uh, we have uh, Marcia Feuerstein today, an author uh, that will uh, cover this topic. One more thing, uh, upcoming events. We always like to inform people about what's uh, coming up in the future. And on uh, June 5th, we uh, have the topic of how to live healthier, happier, and longer in retirement. We have uh, uh, Brad Bickford. He's a semi-retired uh, psychotherapist, also a stand-up comedian. So I'm not sure if you're going to uh, have, we're going to have both of those uh, show up, but um, it's possible. So, and he's going to cover everything from what makes us uh, happy to how to retain muscle strength. And he'll even cover sex in your senior years. Um, I don't know if that involves uh, Kama Sutra or, or what, um, but uh, nonetheless, that's uh, that's a topic uh, uh, as part of that as well. And um, you'll want to actually hang on to that loving feeling for if you're going to tune into our next uh, event after that, because that is going to cover how we got into the uh, political um, uh, situation that we currently uh, find ourselves. Um, um, and historian David uh, uh, Heimfeld has done the research on this for us, and he will describe the ideas and the tactics that set the stage for the MAGA movement that we currently are experiencing. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I'm gonna hand this all over to Louise Kenny, who will introduce our speaker. Louise, take it away. David, uh, thank you. And I would also like to echo David's comment about joining the Special Events Committee. We're a fun group. We like to think of ourselves as a fun group and we're really looking for many varied presentations that will be of, uh, interest to our audience. So, um, so please do think about joining us. Um, we also, as I said, in, uh, we try to do varied presentations and I don't think we've done anything on architecture for a while. Um, and not only are we gonna do one on architecture today, but women in architecture, which is a, a, a specialized field, even though I, our speaker will definitely say there's no such thing as a women's sensibility. An architect is an architect and they can work in all media. But uh, it's a very interesting to, that, that uh, our speaker will be showing us buildings around the world and some even on the East Coast and Midwest that have been designed by women. So um, it's, it's a very interesting topic. Um, our speaker is Marcia um, Feuerstein. And Marcia um, has recently co-authored a book called Latitude, Expanding the Field of Architecture, Women, Practicing, women in Practice Around the Globe. She will present notable international domestic projects uh, describing the design and also the stories behind some of these designs. She has a PhD in architectural theory and history from the University of Pennsylvania. And she's a licensed architect and is currently teaching at Virginia Tech's Washington Alexandria uh, Architecture Center, which is located where I live here in Old Town uh, Alexandria. Uh, she's currently developing an ex ex exhibit with her co-authors, which will be at the National Building um, Museum in Washington late June of 2024. So you will see her here and then you have a chance to follow up uh, to see her, her work and, and uh, the whole exhibit of women in architecture. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Marcia Feuerstein. Marcia? Thank you. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen. Um, Hopefully I do it correctly. Um, hmm. I think, tell me if this is correct. Do you see the, uh, the correct? Uh, no, Marcia, this is the, uh, you know, where it has the two panels. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, I have to share the other one. Okay, stop share, sorry. I knew that was gonna happen. 
Okay, so it would be, huh? Oh, here it is. Okay, there we go. Is that better? Yeah, that looks perfect. Perfect. And I want to try to. Um, okay, move that over. Um, good. Well, well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to um, talk to you about a few, just a few remarkable projects that celebrate women's contributions to the built environment. Um, beginning in 2016, my co-authors, um, uh, Paula Zellner Bassett and Jody Laco, and I um, envisioned a book that would be a collection of uh, 40 contemporary projects completed in the 20th and 21st century that have been built and that just happened to be designed by women. Um, we searched for about a year for projects around the world that we thought were engaging, beautiful, interesting, and that touched us in really inexplicable ways um, and, and, and ways that we wanted to discuss. Uh, simply stating um, the, uh, the situation of finding the projects and discussing them was a little bit more complex than we thought because we showed how um, practice of architecture is really entangled with a collaborative uh, a nature of creative practice itself. Unlike popular culture portrayals of architects, there often is no single visionary who is solely responsible for designing a project. Architecture is created by teams of architectures, architects, designers, engineers, and contracts, contractors, as well as with clients and others, um, and including communities. So every architectural practice is modeled on collaboration, whether it's a small firm consulting with other companies or large firms with in-house house interdisciplinary teams. Uh, I thought I would start by talking a little bit about the idea of women in architecture um, and some surveys that were done um, about uh, women in the profession. So in the past two or more decades, women have joined the profession in much larger numbers than they had before, but they account for less than one quarter of registered architects in the USA. Elsewhere in the world and in leadership positions, these numbers are even lower. Um, and according to a survey by um, of the top 100 international architecture firms published by the architecture online journal Dezine, this was in 2017, only one in 10 of top leadership positions were held by women. They, uh, they in 2022, uh, did a new survey following the format of the original one and found that just three of the world's top 100 um, architecture firms were headed by women, and only and two of them um, had management teams with more than 50% female. Um, lower management positions show a higher proportion of women than previously, but the number of senior women um, has decreased. Still, um, in some firms, there are women that have been promoted to higher positions, but there are still many more um, women than men. When this data was, um, was published, the Danish architect named Dort Mandrup, whose work you see here, described these findings as quite shop shocking. She has her own firm um, in Denmark. And she added that it's interesting also that there are practically no women holding creative director or lead designer positions and that the women are, um, that are on the top positions are really administrative or CEO roles backing up a male star. While the number of women in architecture is improving, it's far from equal and prejudice still find their way into commissions and awards and public recognition, even though women may have um, done a lot of work. Uh, in the field of architecture, recognition and credit and attribution in the press publications and awards has traditionally stemmed from the idea of the sole visionary, um, a master architect. And so um, this situation was described 
by the Italian architect Doriana Mandrelli Fuxas, who is a, a co-founder of Studio Fuxas with her husband, Massimiliano. Um, and she stated, we work together, we sign our names together on projects, but continued, but often in the end, my name doesn't appear, even when I was 90% responsible for the projects. When two individuals work on a project and one of them is well known, that's enough for people. Two people is one too many. And I'm showing you two projects that, uh, that the Fuxas have done together. On the top, this is a project um, that, that is in our book. And the bottom um, is um, the project, a project called New Rome. It's in Rome, it's the EUR Convention Center and hotel, and it's known for its cloud. You can see sort of this cloud hanging in the building. It's from 2016. Uh, uh, Doriana Fuxis's erasure is not unusual. And the erasure of women architects is most evident, oop, I didn't mean to do that, is most evident um, in one of the highest awards um, in the field of architecture the Pritzker Architecture Prize, which is awarded annually to honor a living architect or architects whose built work demonstrates a combination of those qualities of talent, vision, and commitment, which has produced consistent and significant contributions to humanity in the built environment through the art of architecture. It was first awarded in 1979, but it wasn't until 2001 that the award was um, was transitioned from recognizing just one person um, to um, including a partnership with um, Swiss architects, uh, Herzog and de Muron. 10 years later, the idea of awarding partners was rejected when Robert Venturi, the American architect, received the Pritzker Prize without his longtime partner, Denise Scott Brown. And you can see um, the two of them in this slide. Um, Although the two have practiced professionally and collaboratively since uh, 1967. Ironically, two years before Venturi became a laureate and Scott Brown didn't, she wrote a very influential essay called Room at the Top, Sexism and the Star System in Architecture, in which she criticized uh, the range and role of sexism in the attribution of her work to her partner alone. Finally, in 2004, the well-known Iraqi-born architect Zaha Hadid was the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize, and she remained the only female recipient until partners Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara of Grafton Architects received the prize in 2020. Radical and theoretical, her position within a cult of egotistical personalities was defined by critics as idiosyncratic since, as Scott Brown noted, the architectural prima donnas are all male. While the quality of Hadid's work was recognized by her male peers, her interest and design of curvilinear forms was generally interpreted as female, and she was dubbed the queen of the curve by the Guardian critic Rowan uh, Moore. Underlining this point, a little over a month later, critic Oliver Wainwright's headline in The Guardian read, Zaha Hadid's sports stadiums, too big, too expensive, too much like a vagina. Seeking to avoid similar stereotypes, Dort Mandrup, whose work you just saw, stated definitively in response again to this 2017 disease survey that I'm not an, a female architect, I'm an architect, decrying the list that she believes place women in tenuous positions as other, somehow different from their male counterparts. Mandrip is neither wrong nor alone in the sentiment, and she has refused to have her work in books and articles that call out women designers, including our book. However, we believed that unless the contributions of women are explicitly recognized, Great architecture is generally assumed by critics and the public alike to have been designed by men. So I'm gonna talk about some of the projects, three projects, but I thought I'd show you this uh, map that shows where, the, where all the projects of our book 
are located. You can see they're almost all over the world. There are some places that we just couldn't find or couldn't add to. Um, but when we developed and wrote the book, uh, we, we wanted to really try to find projects all over across the globe to reveal the abundant and diverse work designed in many different ways by women. Um, and we refuse to dwell on the idea of the female or the femina, feminine. We try to show, and we, I think we succeed, that there isn't a typical female design or form that women architects work. Um, and they work at a variety of scales and sizes and within many, many contexts. Um, so these projects are noble, uh, no, uh, notable because there are no simple uh, and, and specific female designs. Throughout history, similar books contain projects that happen to be, have been designed by women. And so we hold the position that these 40 projects just happen to be designed by women. In fact, we didn't want to include the word women architects in our book title, but the publishers forced us to because they said no one would buy it unless it said women architects. Um, so this, um, this range of projects, um, and I will show you, as I said, three in detail, um, and then a few others at the end. Um, we recognize the diverse roles of women architects and designers who produce many great buildings. Our intention was to contribute to a global effort at normalizing women in leadership roles as architects and as designers rather than just as managers. The map shows you the location of the 40 projects um, and they are vastly different. And um, I'll be reading some narratives so because there's a lot of information. So I ask you to um, be um, patient. Um, and um, the first one is um, in Budapest. Uh, and I've tried not to show too many drawings, but I'll try to explain them. This is a project, the Central European University in Budapest, and it's by O'Donnell and Toomey. Um, it's a partnership, O'Donnell is female, Toomey is, is um, her husband. Um, and uh, she, she was the, the primary designer on this project. Some, some offices, um, you know, the partners work together um, on all their projects. And in other offices, um, one architect takes the lead, the other ones, the other helps um, or has his or her own project. So she, um, she worked on this project. Um, and, um, and these are two Irish architects and they designed this, um, the Central European University, um, which was, very, was first imagined in eight, 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall and communism. It was officially founded as an international university in 1991, when the Eastern Bloc transformed to democracies and open societies. The university um, was developed from a series of lectures that took place in Dubrovnik in the spring of 1989. Um, and, um, and it was originally set up in three places, Budapest, Prague, and Warsaw. Um, but then in Prague, uh, it left Prague and moved to Budapest, where this project was undertaken. Um, you can see in this image um, that there is a master plan. Um, and, you can, and on the left side um, are some sketches that the architects developed using a map and then a watercolor that, that um, reiterated how they were trying to fit this project into the city. Um, and, um, and so, and in the middle, um, this is a, a view of the entrance shown through, um, through a street from the Danube. So, um, so you can see, and I, I don't know if you can see my, my, um, my, um, carrot here. You can see the Danube River here, and this is the location of the project. Um, and the architects decided that they would develop the project through here and they would create the entrance right here, which is what you see here. And then they were going to develop this series of historic buildings um, with a series of interior walkways, pedestrian walkways, um, that would bring you out over here to connect you with a really a very important um, uh, church. 
Uh, so in here you can see this was another uh, monument on the Danube. You would walk through here. You can see the arrows and the dotted lines and you walk through here and you come out here and you can go here. There's also an entrance over here. Um, and what you can see is um, on the right side of the slide, this drawing right here with the black and red, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, the black and red um, and orange. Uh, there was um, the master plan, which consolidated a group of existing historic and adjacent university buildings. They wanted to create an academic community. Uh, and, um, and they wanted to do this to engender uh, engagement and interaction, which followed the university's principles of, of openness and permeability. The campus, as I said, connects to the neighborhood, the Daniel River and the city at large. And then the academic clusters were interspersed with a series of covered yet open courtyards and inter internal streets, interweaving the buildings with the new and existing public spaces, which is, the way um, Budapest is designed. Um, so what you can see, there are two phases. There's the red one over here, and this one was built, and this one was never built. Um, and the reason it was never built was that when the first, uh, the first phase was completed um, in 2019, um, and they were about to uh, go on with the second phase, Viktor Orban, Hungary's um, far-right prime minister closed the campus and forced it to move to Vienna. So it's it's now in Vienna and this building is, uh, I think it isn't occupied any longer. Um, but the original campus was part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site and had five separate historic buildings that are now connected by this new hidden architectural spine made up of uh, pedestrian streets and courtyards. Uh, and um, and the original idea, as I said, was, um, was to connect the school with the Danube River um, and then with the church. Uh, they demolished a number of interior spaces of existing buildings to create these interior spaces, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, so here you can see uh, the sketch that they developed on what they thought this interior would look like um, and how they wanted to connect the uh, the five historic buildings. So on the left, the watercolor uh, sketch shows you an interior spine. Um, and then the middle and the right photograph of, shows um, the way that they were developing these, these hidden architectural um, act, uh, in, insertions to the historic buildings. So what you can see are the historic building, and then they cleared away some space um, and then added these, um, these walkways. And what they were designing were um, flying staircases, uh, walkways between the existing architecture. All these are very elegant steel sculptural elements um, that uh, connect and act as wayfinding devices. So, they could, so you could find your way through this interior. Um, and they also create a lot of, uh, a number of interior social spaces. Um, that were to encourage interaction and collaboration between the various academic departments. Um, they wanted to create a community, a civic and social space, uh, and create a kind of a new public space that anyone could go into so that the university was open to anyone who wanted to come into it. Um, this is another view of the building. Um, and some of the new built spaces that were designed on the left, you see the new library that they developed that was connected to the spine. Um, and on the right, you can see the library and, and um, a, a kind of a, an, a, a view out into the spine and into the spaces. Um, and you can see, um, in addition, they added a, a, a multi-purpose uh, auditorium, a research research archive, conference facilities, new business school, and a lot of teaching spaces. Um, the circulation space unfolds as a series of sequential interlocked multi-story spaces that open to views from the library, into the atrium, from the top of the stairs, 
out to the sky and roof gardens that promote gatherings within a climate controlled space that offers protection from Budapest's very harsh win winters. Um, the architect said courtyards are the campus. So if you think of other university campuses, you might through, move through a series of outside courtyards that are surrounded by buildings from one space to another. Um, and uh, here the architects designed this series of courtyards inside. And what they wanted to do is provide a lot of natural light and they wanted you to be able to look into and through a lot of different spaces as, as a way of providing transparency and openness. Um, so you could watch people go by, um, but stay separate while you might study. And then, and then you go up to the top. Um, and so on the left, you could see um, this, this is the glass, new glass facade that um, allows you can walk up through this staircase into one of the historic buildings. Um, and then eventually you make your way up to the, the outside um, garden um, space. Uh, it's, uh, it's a roof garden that straddles all five of the historic buildings or all of the historic buildings that were, that were restored. And they provide views over the skyline where you can see that landmark church that I mentioned. It's the, the Svent Istvan Basilica that the architects considered to be really important during the planning stage of the architect. Here, I put the sketch in here. So you remember this was, this is the Budapest up here. Bud I mean, not Budapest, the Danube River. And then you walk down here. And then there is, oh no, this is, sorry, this is, this is the river. You walk down here through the project and here is that, that, um, that uh, basilica. And so here is a beautiful view of the basilica and you can also see it over here in the distance. Um, and it, it provides, um, it, it also, um, uh, our, the, the gardens are very, very densely landscaped. They are designed to provide an environmental and sustainable model for the city. They support native species, pollinators, and other natural environmental processes. And the, um, and the rooftop also has a community garden with green walls and roofs, trellises, and spaces for study, yoga, films. Um, they also developed rainwater collection system that supplies drip irrigation for the for the garden, as well as um, for uh, water efficient toilets and faucets. Uh, the gardens were used to develop, uh, to reduce heat gain as well, to filter air and to create shade to the interior courtyards. These are some views of the street um, and you can see the new entrance. Um, in both of these views, here's one over here, and then you can see it from a different view over here. And, um, and it, the de they designed it to, to be contemporary. You can see how it's very contemporary and this middle view really shows you, it's almost a, a cubic, a cubist, cubism, a cubist kind of construction and geometric structure, uh, construction. But, but, um, but they also um, wanted to, have the buildings um, work within the existing um, street facades as well. Um, then the entrance created a new outside public gathering space on the street. There was nothing like that before. Um, and it was the very first contemporary construction built within this historically protected area. So the architects designed it to maintain the street edge, uh, the existing scale, and the proportional system of the neighboring facades and the existing plot size and building sites. Um, they, they covered it in local limestone used throughout the city. Um, so it both contrasts with the facades because it's so new, but it also alludes to the city's historic stone architecture. Um, so now from um, this very interesting um, urban um, uh, project where the only outside facade you see is this one and everything is basically in a kind of an interior construction, we're going to be moving to um, Bangladesh and to a, a mosque. And this is a very different kind of project. Um, it was designed by Marina Tabassum Architects um, and it's a contemporary mosque 
located in a very fast growing community of lower mi income, um, middle income families in Northern Dhaka in Bangladesh. Um, you can see the building here. Um, it had a very modest buzz budget um, and she primarily used uh, unfinished local red brick and concrete for the building, which um, gave rise to its character. It fits within the context, yet it really stands out from its surroundings. Um, she, um, she developed a very subtle yet intentional site and building design. Um, it was de designed to address the hot and humid climate. Um, so the mosque is a very cool and calm place of respite. Um, it's an attraction for visitors um, and it's a magnet for its local community. From the outside, you see how she in reinvented the mosque as a contemporary architecture based on its uh, traditional Bengal design for what she describes as an essence of Islam devoid of ritualistic and symbolic attributes. It appears to be rooted to its place, growing from a semi-open landscape divided by low brick walls and sheds while surrounded by contemporary concrete housing blocks. It both stands out yet remains unpretentiously content occupying this space between with a sense of belonging to draw the community into a quiet and contemplative and cool space. So you can see how it's sort of a lower brick building surrounded by these towers um, within this lower space. The mosque is set onto a low plinth above the street, which creates a sacred plane above the city and everyday life. The plinth protects against seasonal flooding, flooding and creates a public space for the city. Here's a plan. Um, where you can see it. Its colonnade faces the street and is a liminal space between the outside and the inside, a place to sit, to talk, to meet, and to take shelter from the heat. The orientation of the site created a 13 degree axial shift between the street and Mecca, becoming a key to its unique design. And so you can see that's the direction of Mecca. Um, and when we move out from the city, um, then um, from the city and go into the sacred uh, gathering space, you have to shift to Mecca. Yet the design, the mosque was designed for community. Um, it's many staircases from different directions from its site, create a welcoming place of worship with a social and communal gathering space. And it's made comfortable by constant air movement that goes through the building's brick breathing walls. These are, these are the brick breathing walls right here, um, um, which allow the air to infiltrate and move through the building. The space is non-hierarchical without ornament, dome, or minarets, and it is designed to provide a space for worship and contemplation that creates an atmosphere of wonder and grace. The mosque is made up of three volumes that create a layered sequence of spaces um, that, that go from, that move you into the prayer hall. There's a brick outer square. And so take a look at the, um, the drawings on the side. The brick outer square is there. Uh, and parallel to the road, it is um, where a brick cylindrical volume nests. And so there you see a, the cylindrical volume within the square. And then a concrete pray a prayer hall, which is here. The interaction between the outer square and the cylinder creates four light wells. If you look at the lower, lower plan, there are the four light wells. A col the colonnade I talked about before, right there. Entrance halls, there. Um, um, ablution, washing, there. And another light well, right in the corner at the bottom. And, um, and then there are other interstitial spaces 
between the outer and inner, inner cylinder. Um, the traditional brick construction created the porous brick facade that wraps the prayer hall, providing ventilation to the interior. So you can see here, this is wrapping the prayer hall. And here is another view of, of the, the, um, the air, the air um, space, the light well. Um, the architect states that um, that light emanates at the core, remains at the core of the design. And you can see it here in this photograph, these both of these photographs. The vertical slit in the outer wall locates the direction of Mecca, which is right here. And um, its bright light is visible throughout the prayer hall. Um, light also um, filters through the bricks and from the roof. Star-like pinpricks of light project into the reflective floor of the mosque, implying a sky above and beyond. The materials are brick, light, and air, defining a very sacred spiritual space through an emotive language of architecture that Tabassum created in her pursuit for an innovative and contemplative atmosphere filled with this flowing air and this changing light. The project evokes um, Phyllis, uh, Louis Kahn's words. Louis, Louis Kahn was a famous Philadelphia architect, um, and he wrote, light is material life. At the threshold, the crossing of silence and light, lies the sanctuary of art, the only language of man. It is the treasury of the shadows. Whatever is made of lights, light casts a shadow. Our work is of shadow. It belongs to light. So this is um, the, the mosque that, that, um, that Tabassum designed. And next, we will go to, um, to a museum in Tokyo. This, this museum um, by Japanese architect Kayuza Sajima um, was designed to house and exhibit the work of the renowned artist Hokusai Katsushika a master of, of graphic art in the Edo period and his disciples. Um, Sajima examined his unique drawing and composition methods as she was developing the building. Um, and she used shimmering panels to create unique visual reflections onto the exterior wall panels. I'll show you a few more um, of his um, works. Let's see, here we go. Um, Hokusai's work was considered very original at the time and very different from traditional art of, the of his time. He developed a very unique geometric-based system that provided various perspectives within a single work. And he was obsessed with experimenting with foreign drawing methods, and he included ritualist, uh, re realistic details and dramatic expressions through the lines and compositions that analyze geometric structures, expanding traditional Japanese painting styles to create a new uh, spatial order. So Sajima designed um, her building um, in, um, to, um, to allow people to interact with and become knowledgeable of local culture. Um, the museum is, 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 is located in Sumida Ward in Tokyo. It's an area rooted in traditional crafts, and it's set near a small park um, in Ryo, Ryo Goko. Here's the park. Um, and it was the birthplace of Hokusai himself. Um, and you, I just added that so you <laughs> remember it's Hokusai's work. Um, and, um, and she designed the museum building within this, within this complex urban fabric bounded by train tracks and a main road and a children's park and mixed use buildings. In um, its modern identity and volume, which contrasts with historic wood architecture um, is almost hidden. It, um, if, you, if you look at it within the city, um, and it maintains a silent expression and familiarity with the quiet yet dense urban atmosphere of the town, the park, and the buildings. So there's the museum 
um, set within this urban um, context. And here's an overview of that urban area and you can see the museum right over here. You can almost miss it if you look at it from a distance. The building is a monolithic mass with slit building, with slit openings, yet because of its exterior tilted matte wall surfaces, at times the museum is, appears almost transparent. The outside vaguely reflects its surroundings while blending into the sky. Her contextual approach tempers geometric and spatial arrangements with the various programs of the museum. At the same time, the museum maintains a relationship with the outside and the inside, the museum and the city. The museum's tilted exterior walls gather and reveal unique shimmering reflections of the surrounding parks, buildings, and sky. So you can really see the vagueness of this building right here, how it reflects the area. And this is the park, the children's park um, here. And this is a bit of the children's park over here. The various slits um, within and through the building allows anyone to move through the mass without actually going into the museum. Um, and then other slits were added to add more light into the spaces and to break up the mass of the building volume. Um, it, it's primarily an archive of original, very uh, fragile work. So um, they needed to really think about how to provide light into the public spaces um, while maintaining um, darkness um, within the gallery spaces. The outside opening, the covering, is made up of almost 250 very uniquely shaped rectangular and polygon aluminum panels. The panels are etched and then electro-polished and then precisely joined. Some were tilted inward, others were tilted outward through the entire building. Her design recalls his unique geometric-based work and his combination of various perspectives within a single work. Um, so here you can see um, the way you can move through the building without going in through these um, tilted glass passageways, um, allowing you to see the building and decide whether you want to go in or not. Um, the building is organized vertically through programmatic volumes whose spaces merge and shift forming a prismatic and segmented series of vertical exterior walls. Um, there doesn't see, there is no real discernible entry from the outside. So as I said, you enter the ground floor, which is divided into four spaces um, and um, through an exterior passage. And so on the left, you'll see these four spaces. That's the way you enter uh, through those four um, passages. Um, it's a little bit, light you can't quite see it um, so but there are four different ways you can enter the the mass of the building um, and then um, and then there are uh, a few um, spaces there's a reception space a library space a lecture hall and the circulation core that links the um, upper floors um, of the exhibition spaces It's a really very beautiful building, um, and um, and you can really see um, see how the outside and inside are merged on the right, which is the um, the entrance and the elevators, uh, so that you can be on the inside and look outside and see the uh, see the shops, um, and then on the left you can see how there are various tilted spaces, um, there's a spiral staircases, uh, spiral staircase. Um, but all in all, um, she wanted to design uh, very comfortable and quiet spaces that were filled with very bright and soft light from these exterior still, silt, uh, slit windows um, while creating a, a free movement and a very comfortable atmosphere 
um, that uh, creates contrast with brightness on the outside and darkness of the museum itself. So I've shown you three projects um, and, and they were all designed by women. Um, and we have about 15 minutes left. Um, and so I thought I'd show you a few more projects um, and talk very briefly about them that projects that are in in the pro in the bill uh, sorry in the book um, this, this is a project in Uruguay it is a winery by um, Bormida and um, Yazon architects um, and as you can see it's it looks as if the building is is um, is floating in water um, and there are you know a lot more images that show the actual winery um, spaces, but these are these are sort of the beautiful shots um, in in the in the site. Uh, here's another very unusual project, very different from the previous one. Um, and this is a project. It's a museum that's um, that's in Para, um, which is in um, Peru, um, and it's the Nash, It's inside the National Park of Paracas. It's the site museum of Paracas culture, um, and it's. Um, it's really designed um, based on a, an original museum that was built in 1968 and destroyed during an earthquake. Um, and it was, um, was rebuilt um, and it, it tries to reinterpret the environmental, historic and cultural context in very simple yet powerful and sophisticated ways. Moving to North America and Mexico. This is um, a project Centro uh, Cultural Lanogaro. Um, and she was named, the, the center is named after uh, Garo, who is a prolific Mexican screenwriter, journalist, and playwright, a storyteller and novelist um, of the early 20th century. And it's, um, and it's in a, uh, an area that was an, considered an artist's con, um, con, a, enclave. Um, and the project um, is, um, is built in front of an existing mansion, historic mansion, um, and they repurposed the, and expanded the mansion um, to house a bookstore, which you can see here, um, and classrooms and an auditorium. And here is a view of the bookstore built around the entry to the uh, mansion, historic mansion. This is a very, next one is a very unusual project. It's also in Bangladesh, and it was a school um, that was designed um, by Anna Herringer and Ike Rose, Ike Rosebog. Uh, and uh, it was really a, a design that was created so that not only for students, a school, but it was designed so that it could be built by the students. Uh, it was handmade by everyone in the community and the architects redeveloped traditional bamboo architecture that was being used in that area. Um, uh, and they, they developed it so that it would be protected from the, um, the floods, the, the seasonal floods that often wash away the buildings. This is part of a much larger uh, uh, development that uh, they've continued. Uh, it, it now includes dormitories, um, but this is a, a, a very unusual and a very beautiful project, but very different from the previous ones you've seen. This is a, um, a project in South Africa, and it was designed by Sonia Spammer for her mother-in-law in Cape, Cape Town. Another that's very different from the previous one, which is in Namibia, and it's a visitor center um, out of um, reused and recycled materials that were locally found in the, um, in the site. This is um, a parish house that was designed 
um, for a historic church. Um, the parish house is right here. And you can see this is the historic church. It, it creates a little space between the two so that they could get into the building. And as they were constructing the building, um, they discovered some um, archeological ruins that they decided to keep and maintain. And so they lifted the building up one floor so that you could look down into it and you could walk into and among, well, uh, among the, they were protected, um, but um, you could see them. And, um, and the building mass takes its form from the existing architecture but uses new materials. And this is in Reba, Denmark. This is a project in Estonia, the Estonian National Museum by Lena Gottme. She's Lebanese, um, but they won a competition for this national museum in Tartu, Estonia. Um, and you can see the view of the project, various views. This is a view showing the long length of it. Um, this is a view of it from the front. And this is a view from the back in the snow. It was built on an abandoned um, um, air, um, airport. And the design was created to look as if it was taking off from the abandoned airfield. And I will go through um, a few more quickly. Um, here is one in Australia, a project, another house, the um, Malumba House, designed by Andresen O'Gorman in Queensland. This one is a project in China. We have two in China. Uh, it's a tea house um, by uh, DNA Design, um, and the architect uh, is Zhu Tian Tian. And it's within a, an historic uh, a, a area that they, that they grow tea. Uh, the the uh, Damushan tea, Songyan Damushan Tea Valley. Um, and um, and it, they've been uh, producing tea for over 1800 years and are developing some projects to try to have people move back into these villages from the cities. And these are a few projects that they've developed. This is one of a few projects that this architect has developed um, to get more tourists into the area. Uh, this is another project. It's a huge project, a museum, Ningbo History Museum um, by Amateur Architecture Studio, Lu Wen Yung and Wang Shu. This is another example of, of, of um, an architect, Wang Shu, the male who received the Pritzker Prize. Um, and Lu and Yu was not, did not, even though they do all of their projects together. Finally, we have a project in the US. Um, and this one is um, in Glencoe, Illinois. It's by Studio Gang, Jeannie Gang. It's a very beautiful um, uh, theater. Here in Philadelphia, uh, you can go and visit this one if you haven't already, the Barnes Foundation Museum by Todd Williams and Billy Chen. Um, Billy, um, it, uh, work, they work on it together, um, and, uh, and it's, if you know the Barnes Foundation, this is the new project that was built in the center city. This one is in New York City. It's a little project. It's the Spring Street Salt Shed um, by Claire Weiss, um, done with Datner Architects, and basically it's a little sculptural building to store salt so it can be used in the winter for the streets. It's actually one of my favorite little projects. You may know this project, um, uh, The Shed in New York City. Um, it's a project by uh, Diller, Scafidio and Renfro, Elizabeth, Liz, Liz Diller. Um, worked very much on this um, with Scafidio and Renfro. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's above, it's, it's, it Hudson Yards in New York. Um, and, uh, uh, this, this building is interesting because the outer shell can move in and out, uh, depending upon what they decide to do 
with this. It's a performance and art gallery, performance space. And um, I'll go through these pretty quickly. This is a, another house in Toronto. Um, and it's an arts, art studio building um, in Winnipeg in Canada. Here is a project in Dakar in Senegal, a beautiful conference center with a, with a large overhanging roof that provides shade and cooling for the building. Um, uh, uh, Kame Pinos designed this project, which is, a, which is a forum in Zaragoza in Spain. I think we have another one. Here's the entrance of it. Um, and then, and then this is a, an interesting project. Uh, it's a, it was a convent that um, has um, just a few little um, additions to it. They kept the basically ruined quality, the weathered quality of the building and added things like a bridge. There's the bridge. And, um, and then there's a new roof, new lighting and an elevator, but everything else retains what was removed and lost. Um, they just wanted to show the traces of the history of the building. Um, here's another view of it. Um, and then you already saw this one by Fuxas. And then finally, um, I think this is the last, oh no, there's there are two more. Um, uh, this, is, this is a project by Grafton Architects who I mentioned as winning the 2020 Pritzker Prize. Uh, both partners are female and they work um, together on all their projects. This is a project in Milan. It's a, a, a university uh, uh, for e um, e economics, they teach economics. Um, a Mekanu Library uh, in Delft, University of Technology. Now Mekanu um, is, uh, is founded by um, Francine Hoban, who, who, um, who did the uh, restoration of MLK Library, which is was designed by the famous architect Mies van der Rohe, um, and her firm um, did the the new development. It was completely um, refurbished and redeveloped and expanded. So you can visit that downtown in DC. But this is a library they did for um, for the the Delft University of Technology. And then this is a this is um, Another building um, by um, McCullum Mulvane, Val, Val Mulvane did, did the project um, and it's an old, an existing historic um, church that was transformed into a library. So they kept the integrity of the library on the outside and the inside. And then they inserted this structure um, which holds all the library functions. You can see in this, drawing, this lovely drawing. This is the plan. This is the new floor that they put in and walls, um, but they kept all the, all the walls, the existing walls, and they restored them. And so that's it. That's what I have. This is our book, um, Expanding Field of, Arch Field of Architecture, Women in Practice Across the Globe. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions um, you have. Um, and um, I just wanted to mention that the exhibit will be very different than the book. We're going to be using just a few projects, including just a few projects, but we're going to try to get original artifacts, um, drawings, paintings, little models, big models of, um, of the projects by the architects, because we want everyone to see how architects um, like to go about and develop their projects, how they design them and how they go through the sort of ideas and concepts as they work towards a, a new building. So thank you, everyone. Marcia, that was just great. Just great. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And I um, always think a sign of a, 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 an engaging presentation is, is when everybody stays till the end. So uh, <laughs> oh, congratulations. That's good. And congratulations, um, uh, everybody stayed at really just because you did a great job and it's an interesting topic. Uh, I was glancing down the uh, participant list and there were men in there, but it were largely women. Um, so particularly interested in women architects. So I would like to be, to kick things off, I would like to ask a quick question. What do women 
uniquely bring to the field of architecture? It's hard to say because everyone's woman, every, every woman is a very different personality. I mean, yep. um, you know, they, 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 um, I mean, my, my argument and our argument is that they bring the same kind of thing that Ben bring to the field of architecture. There really isn't any real difference. I do okay. want to say that, 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 um, that there, there is a, uh, there seems to be a lot of collaboration um, um, when they develop the work. Um, um, but again, there are, there are other, other women who, who are less collaborative. Um, the, for example, um, the project that I showed you, uh, the one that is, I talked about the MLK Library, Memorial Library. Right. Um, that's by Mekanu. Uh, Francine Hoban, uh, when we were working on the, on the uh, book, she didn't want us to use her name. I mean, she want, we had to list every single person that worked on the project. Um, and so there are, there are like 20 or 30 people that are listed um, in the book on who worked on the project because she really said, I don't do this alone. I have a lot of help and, um, and, my, um, and my, um, my work is the result of a lot of people's expertise and love and dedication. And we heard that from a number of people, um, but, but we didn't hear it from everyone. Uh, okay. so, so, so that's really the answer. And, and the practices are so different too, because some of the um, firms that we, we work, we, we included uh, our partners, um, a husband and wife, or, a, or, or, um, or two, a, ma a, a male, male and a female who are not married, you know, but they're partners. Um, others are sole practitioners. They do their own projects alone. Um, and, um, and some are in very large firms and, and they, um, they get their own projects. So the project in um, Senegal is a very large architecture firm, but that building happened to be designed by a woman. Um, so that's, um, so it's, I don't know if I answered your question, but. That's well, I, um, I, your answer was what I anticipated based on our earlier conversations. Now that these are talented individuals who happen to be women. Yes. Uh, versus a woman's style. So, yes. I, so thank you for that. Yes. So yes. a number of people asked about the mosque the woman that designed her was one of the team to develop the mosque. Yes. And uh, it's interesting, uh, Anne makes the comment here that it's interesting that a woman was asked to lead the team, I guess, to do that. And then somebody else asked, um, what more do we know about her? Who, who is she a prominent person from a prominent family or what, what about her? It's a really good question. Um, so, and the answer might be what you expect. She, she was married, but then she left her husband and she, now practices alone. And this was a project that her grandmother wanted her to do. So it was a family thing. Um, I think it was her grandmother who provided the money. And so they, they wanted her to design it. Um, and so uh, she did, you know. Um, she is a very, very um, well-known architect um, and, uh, and has done a lot of work a lot of different kinds of work recently. Um, so uh, she's, um, she's very, um, uh, uh, very well known um, um, in, um, in Dhaka and Bang Bangladesh. And she's also has, I think most of her work is, is um, local, um, but she is also teaching in other places. I think she was teaching at Harvard University recently. Um, is there a is there a sisterhood of female architects? Is there a bonding, or it's there there are architects, plain and simple, or is there a, a do you know well, them from around the well, world? Well, you know, we had a very difficult time finding projects. I mean, we didn't have a difficult finding projects. We, I mean, we had to we had to be very care. Uh, we had to we we looked all over and we found um, projects. Um, through various uh, uh, um, through various, what shall I say? Um, we looked at different awards, and we looked at uh, and through a lot of journals to try to f discover these projects. But it wasn't always easy because, especially the projects in Africa and um, and 
even Asia, uh, were difficult to find. And women, a lot of women don't publicize what they do. You know, the only way we find them is through publicity. Um, so it was, um, it was difficult. Now, the question about having a kind of a sisterhood, the American Institute of Architects does have a women in architects group, a, a group. So they, they have their own group. I don't, and I know that there are other um, uh, groups in different places. We found a number of our, number of our projects um, in um, South America and in Australia um, through separate organizations, um, online, online um, organizations that, that are just for women in architects. So that's how we found a lot of them. I mean, there isn't a global one, but I think there are a lot of local ones. Oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, Patricia Brennan asked the question, are young women students being welcomed into School of Architecture these days? Oh, yes, very much. In fact, um, <coughs> some schools, there are more women than men. I mean, here at um, Washington Alexandria Architecture Center, um, I was teaching studios where I had um, all women and only two men. Um, now, that might be different. We, we get students who come from Blacksburg, but we also get students who just want to come to our program. And it may have been because we had three women teaching. I mean, there aren't that many uh, female professors. And I mean, I'm, I'm also an architect. So we're all, we're all architects. Um, we've practiced in the past um, and we're also professors. So, um, but, I, but I know that there are a lot of women in architecture. Now the problem is keeping women once they graduate and practice because it's not always easy to maintain um, practice and uh, a life that you can live with children and marriage and things like that. So it, it makes it a little difficult. There are a lot of firms that are changing their, the way they um, hire and, and retain um, peop, uh, women, but, um, but it, 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 in the past, it's been very difficult. Um, okay. That's one reason that, that a lot of women haven't become partners. I think they're doing a lot more though. In Washington, DC, there's some very good architecture firms that, that really promote their women. Is it, a, is it a selling point if you go in to pitch a business, you know, that a given project is coming up for you to talk about the um, composition of your architectural team and the fact that there's so many women? Is that a plus in today's environment or is it just not really a factor? Well, I know that I know that um, and I'm not an architect and I don't practice these. I mean, I am an architect, but I don't practice now. So I don't know everything. But I know that you can you can get a minority status. So if you're a woman owned business then it helps you. Um, and I know a number of, um, of women who are, are, are able to um, practice um, and get projects because they're a minority, especially if you're, if you're getting um, you know, a government project. Uh, there, was, there has been questions in the past on how, how these women got, their pro got the projects in the first place. And, um, and many of them won competitions. So there are different kinds of competitions and different countries do it differently. Like in Germany, I think um, if, it's a, if it's a public project, um, you have to enter a competition. Um, you come, you tell them what you've done, you show them what you, what you plan on doing, and then they make a decision that way. Um, and then there are, then there are co uh, worldwide competitions where you, where you enter a, a scheme um, and they don't know who you are. Um, and then they choose the winning, winning solution. And that's how that project in um, Estonia was, was built. That was, the, that was a winning competition. Is that a normal way that things happen in competitions or are there, is there bidding on jobs? I mean, how does, what's the, well, what's the protocol? Well, normal, normally, you know, you, uh, well, it depends. I mean, you, um, there's, there's requests for proposals, those kinds of things, Re requests for qualifications. You can get on a list like in the, the U.S. government. Um, I, I mean, I, um, so you, you can, you can submit your, your, um, your work, your, you know, your, your, what, what you've done before. Um, and, um, and then they, they make a decision. Sometimes, um, sometimes um, you're invited to um, submit something. Um, that's how, um, how I think Mekanu did the um, MLK, um, MLK library. Um, that's how they wanted. They, they were invited among others to, to submit because they've done a lot of libraries. Um, 
and they were invited to submit and they won they won the uh, project are, are well, women these are you just have you know you, you people find out about you and they they ask if you'll work on on their project so have women um especially husband wife teams um have the women managed to get equal billing i mean is it better is well it getting i mean I, I did show you a number of um husband wife teams and they get equal billing now they do because in the yeah, beginning I mean, the, the, the one in the Budapest, uh, rush yeah. library right. yeah um there was one project we wanted to include it was a a a, a, a male and female partner um and it was one particular project that i had seen when i was in germany and I contact them and they said, absolutely not. And I said, why? And he says, because we collaborate. And, and so we don't, and, and there was, there was some, some problem in the past where um, the, they were claiming that the man did, the, the, the male did the project, but they collaborated and they were dismissing her. And I, I said, well, but we've got projects where you collaborate, you know? I mean, the, the shed is a collaboration. Um, and, and um, Barnes Foundation is a collaboration um, between two partners who work together and develop ideas together. Um, but they just absolutely were adamant. They weren't gonna, they weren't gonna be in the book because, um, because of this, this idea that, I don't know, it, it's, it's difficult to um, understand, but yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So just spend a moment and tell us about what's coming up next year at the National uh, Building Maybe. Museum. Okay. Well, it's still in the planning st stages, but we are um, we are going to be uh, opening the exhibit. Um, we plan to open the exhibit um, on the day that the American Inst Institute of Architects um, National um, Convention um, begins in Washington D.C., and so it'll be a place where all the architects will come and see the projects. Um, and we've, we've chosen a few projects, um, a few architects who do really interesting um, studies before they, in, in the way they, in, um, as they develop their designs, they do beautiful studies, models, um, paintings, some of the, um, I think I, I included a few sketches, watercolors. Uh, the Budapest project, there are a number of beautiful little models where they developed all different possibilities. They studied all poss different possibilities for the facade. Um, there are maybe 30 of them, all wooden, uh, all paper um, models on their beautiful models. And so we wanted to try to get those original models um, and include those in the, in the exhibits so that people could see how architects work. And, and so we're trying to say that this is how all our, many architects work and not just women. Uh, many architects work this way. And that's really what the, the exhibit is going to be. There are going to be these artifacts um, used as you develop designs. There is one architect, the, the Japanese architect that I showed you. Um, they don't use a lot of um, physical models. They do a lot of digital work. So we're going to try to figure out how we can include, include that kind of um, practice in the, um, in the exhibit as well. It's very different. You know, there's so many digital models um, and, and um, projects that you never really have anything physical until the building is built. Um, so, so that's what it's going to be. And it's going to be, um, I think we're gonna have, I'm trying to remember, I think we're gonna have maybe 12 architects um, projects and um, it'll be very nice. Um, and it'll also include a, um, a, a tour um, um, that that show that allows you to see projects in the DC and um, Northern Virginia, Maryland area of projects by women architects, and we'll have a we'll have um, uh, a map that that allows you to walk in a walking map, and so that'll include, of course, the MLK Library as well as um, the project in Arlington Cemetery, which was designed by Weissman uh, Manfredi, the, uh, the um, what is it called? The, um, the Women's Memorial. Women's, uh, women's Memorial, uh, Women in Military Service right. um, uh, Museum uh, in Arlington Cemetery. That was designed by um, Marion Weiss. 
and uh, and 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 Manfredi, their 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 um, their partners. Um, and there are a lot. There are a lot of really wonderful projects in in the D.C. area in this area um, that were designed by women. So uh, that's going to be a really important part of our um, of the exhibit. Well, everybody, mark that on your calendars. Late late June, two thousand twenty four. Um, at the wonderful uh, National Building Museum, which is wonderful in and of itself, just to start with, right, as a location. So also check out um, um, Marcia's book, um, expand, uh, what, the Latitude, Expanding. No, 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 it's, 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 Latitude is the name of the exhibit. Um, oh. Okay. The Latitude is the name of the exhibit, but the, the book is titled Expanding Field of Architecture. Okay, Women sorry. In sorry the yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So, so yeah. both are available. Uh, this was very enlightening. This was very fun. Um, Thank you. Especially, especially for us women, but I would expand it to the, the larger group. So thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Well, thank you. So. Okay. okay.